Well, uh, Jamie was doing the, the classic uh, slippery slope. Uh, and uh, he actually knows the answers to many of these questions. I'm quite confident because there are various other doctrines in the law that are applicable to various of these questions that he has raised. Uh, first is he really doesn't correctly characterize Citizens United. Citizens United said you cannot discriminate among speakers because the First Amendment doesn't confer rights on entities or persons, but simply protects a activity, if you will, and that is uh, speech. Now, uh, uh, yes, I, I, I favor a disclosure of, for political actors. That is, candidates, uh, PACs, and political parties when they engage in their election-related activity. Uh, what I don't agree with, and, and I also agree that when somebody you know, puts an ad in the paper, uh, like a corporation, let's say an advocacy group, puts an ad in the paper, they can be required to uh, report that ad if it expressly advocates the election of a, of a candidate. And if somebody gave the corporation money for that purpose, you can report, you can require the reporting of that. But what I'm not in favor of is uh, pretending that all the donors to a, a C4 advocacy group is, uh, are giving money for their limited political purposes and requiring all of them to be uh, reported, uh, just like I think the court was right in the NAACP case, uh, in a, uh, where, where they held that the uh, in the late uh, 40s that the state of Alabama could not have the membership list of the NAACP uh, because it uh, chills and discourages uh, political association and speech, and that cost is too great. Uh, churches is not a campaign finance issue. Uh, yes, uh, churches. Can, in campaign finance laws can be treated just like everybody else. What it is, is a tax issue uh, that, if, 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 that be, they are afforded not-for-profit uh, status, uh, therefore uh, the, uh, uh, they don't pay corporate tax, and the government and the Supreme Court has ha held that uh, we don't have to, quote, subsidize uh, uh, political activity like we subsidize charitable uh, activity. And, uh, and said that you know you could limit, uh, therefore, uh, church's political activity. Uh, any uh, so uh, so that was a completely different doctrine that had nothing to do with uh, uh, campaign finance. Uh, the next is government speech. Also, really has uh, no real uh, campaign finance implication. The, there there is other implications. Uh, the court the court has held consistently that the government can. Uh, advocate a one side of an issue or not, uh, without having to advocate the other side. Even a political issue, you know, say no to drugs. Uh, uh, it was a famous one uh, years ago. And uh, they don't have to say, say no to drugs, but oh, oh yes, also say yes to drugs. You know, uh, they, they can take a position. Now, I, I do think uh, involving a direct political activity gets into another line of cases. Uh, which is the line of cases about the rights of taxpayers, and most uh, uh, importantly uh, uh, developed, the right of union members who are required by government to uh, be a member of a union. Can their dues be used for political purposes? That, in, that involves the free speech rights of a union member. And uh, similarly, I think there are some free speech rights of, a, of the taxpayer uh, even though that area is not at all uh, very well developed. Yes, uh, I don't see any justification on pro prohibiting uh, corporations or labor unions from contributing to candidates subject to contribution limits uh, because uh, th there is nothing more uh, quid pro quo corrupting about a union co contribution or a corporation contribution than there is an, in uh, an individual. And so again, the, if any of the speaker doesn't matter, um, rights of shareholders are not in the same p position as union members uh, because uh, shareholders uh, freely associate, uh, where union members, uh, the reason they have a right against government is because government's forcing them to be a member of the union. Uh, you don't have a First Amendment right against a private entity, which would be a union that you freely join, but if the government makes you do it, uh, now you have rights uh, that the First Amendment protects. Uh, shareholders not being required by the government to buy any uh, shares, so they're free, free to come and go, 
and the First Amendment doesn't apply in that situation to what the corporation does. And yes, uh, I don't see any reason why corporations can't communicate to uh, their workers and as well as uh, other uh, members of the general public about their political views. And it would seem to me that workers uh, in a particular company uh, would be very, at least most of them, would be very interested in that uh, because, after all, they, this is the source of their jobs uh, and they would like to, to know, in balancing all the issues that are involved in, in a particular election, uh, you know, uh, one guy's going to give you free condoms, and, uh, you know, but, well, but the other guy might save your job because he won't regulate your country, company out of business. You know, you can balance those things and decide, uh, who, you know, who you ought to vote for. Uh, so I, I don't see anything inherently, uh, just as labor unions uh, cannot be prevented uh, from communicating to their members about uh, the same, uh, same issues. So, did I cover all your questions? I think you did. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to avoid <laughs> the weeds of uh, jurisprudence theory here and, and talk about, once again, what really did happen. Uh, you know, prior to the Citizens United decision, it was generally the campaign finance regime that individuals could make contributions, individuals could make expenditures, but not corporations because they're artificial entities and that as an individual, I, for instance, could not dip into your pocket and take your money and spend it how I want to spend it. I mean, we all, as individuals, have our own right to spend our money as we see fit when it comes to campaigns. I really don't believe those five justices on the Roberts Court thought through what they were saying on the Citizens United decision. They kept referring to corporations as like this ambiguous whole unit and you know, envisioning them as making you know, these campaign contributions or expenditures. And that isn't really what's happening here. What's happening is by opening up the field to corporate expenditures, that allowed the CEO of a corporation to dip into the corporate till, take other people's money, and spend that money as he or she sees fit when it comes to elections. Unless the corporation had internal rules prohibiting this, we have no statute on the books or no regulations that governs this. The United Kingdom that has allowed corporate contributions for quite some time has set up a uh, Shareholder Protection Act, but we've got nothing on the books. Uh, in the United Kingdom, if a CEO wants to spend $5 million of everyone else's money in the corporation, the CEO has to let everyone else know and let the shareholders know and let the shareholders even vote on whether that should happen in the first annual shareholder meeting. We've got no such protections here. We just have a Supreme Court that somehow seemed to think that a corporation is a single unit, and it isn't. It's, it's literally letting the heads of the corporation start spending other people's money how they want to spend it. There is a movement afoot that has gained tremendous steam that was filed by uh, 10 law professors before the Securities and Exchange Commission, literally asking the SEC to step in and resolve this. Uh, so this petition is pending right now that would get the SEC to pass regulations saying, hey, if you're a publicly owned corporation, you, it, 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 the CEO can't just spend secretly everyone else's money without first informing shareholders. This petition is hopefully going to see the light of day uh, next year, but you know, we'll see. That's, that's one of the things we're heading towards. And I, I, I do want to emphasize I mean, the problem here is the one of the problems is the lack of transparency. And because you've got these CEOs of corporations that can dip into the till and spend the money, we've seen where this money is coming from disappear off the books. I showed you the chart of, of transparency, donor transparency dropping to 50%. And the reason is not because of super PACs, as Jim Bob was trying to claim 17% uh, of the money to a super PAC comes from corporations. As I was explaining right away, that isn't where the corporate money is going because super PACs do, in fact, have to disclose their contributors. So where this corporate money is flowing is into the 501c nonprofit groups that don't disclose the contributors. 
That's where the 50% lack of donor disclosure is coming from. That's where the corporate money is going. Uh, there is some corporate money that's flown into the super PACs, but not a whole lot. I find it interesting that uh, Jim talked so much about Chevron. Uh, Chevron did make major contributions to super PACs, and by the way, that violates another federal law against government contractors making campaign contributions to super PACs, uh, which we're going to hear more about later on. The issue when we have super PACs, and, you know, I, I made it clear at the beginning. I want regulation in the campaign finance disclosures and regulations applying to corporations, to unions, to super PACs, to nonprofit groups. I'm not choosing one side over another. Uh, I want it straight across the board. Uh, regulation and transparency system, much as what we had prior to the uh, Citizens United decision, then we can build upon that. As I emphasize, those super PACs are particularly dangerous because, as we've shown, these super PACs are, in fact, just second fundraising committees for candidates. They are not like the, uh, even the Chamber of Commerce that has multiple purposes. These are committees that have been set up by the former staff, by the father, the mother of the candidates in order to collect these unlimited contributions from very wealthy interests and corporate interests in supporting a candidate. As a second fundraising committee, that's where the real, real extreme danger of corruption comes from. I mean, you know, Romney, uh, Newt Gingrich could not, had they won, could not have just shunned Sheldon Adelson and said, thank you very much for the money, I'll see you later. You know, uh, don't come knocking at my door or the White House. I mean, that's, that's the real danger that we're facing here. Well, I just have a few points that uh, I want to respond to. First, one thing that you didn't hear in either of the presentations uh, from the, the pro-reform side here is any evidence, any citation at all, that the 26 states that followed the rule announced in Citizens United before Citizens United was decided were any worse for it. More than half the country already allowed unlimited corporate and union spending, and there is not a shred of evidence that those states were any more corrupt or less well-governed than states that did not. We ran a controlled experiment for half a century, and what we found is that the laws just don't make any difference. We well, also want to point out I also want to point out that there is an intermediary between us and this parade of horribles that we keep hearing about, and that intermediary is called voters. The only thing that Citizens United sanctioned is that corporations are allowed to engage in peaceful efforts to try and persuade voters to share their point of view. Whether those efforts are successful is 100% up to the voters, and there is no shortage of examples in American history of people spending enormous amounts of money trying to sell people ideas that they just weren't going to buy. Linda McMahon has now spent $100 million trying to get into the Senate, and she has failed both times. Sheldon Adelson spent $53.7 million trying to get eight different Republican candidates elected, and all of them lost. Uh, was, uh, American Crossroads spent like $100 million. 1.29% of that money was spent on successful races. The fact of the matter is, Voters are perfectly capable of listening to these messages, giving them the weight that the voters think that they are due, and then making up their mind accordingly. I also think it's interesting that the reform community has suddenly taken up this strong interest in corporate governance, which wasn't something that was really on their radar before. We have this act called the Shareholder Protection Act that's being debated, but quite obviously the purpose of it is to not to protect shareholders, but to prevent corporations from participating. It's simply trying to do indirectly what you couldn't do directly. And how will it achieve that? Well, campaigns move fast. You have to react quickly or not at all. And if you have to get uh, prior approval from your shareholders at the beginning of the year before you're allowed to speak on political issues, you're just not going to be able to do it. Finally, on the, uh, the idea that we should, uh, that the Supreme Court should overturn Citizens United, uh, or that we should pass a constitutional amendment. 
both of these would be literally unprecedented. Jamie can correct me if I'm wrong. I am aware of no example in American history where the US Supreme Court has found speech to be unambiguously protected by the First Amendment and then later changed their mind. It just hasn't happened. And of course, we've also never passed an amendment to the Constitution to limit one of the freedoms protected in the Bill of Rights. There's no evidence from the 26 states that allowed this many four citizens united that we should start now. Okay, let me take a shot at some of this. First of all, um, were reformers or progressives never interested in the processes of corporate governance before? I think that that was the essence of Ralph Nader's career for many years was to promote corporate democracy and the power of shareholders. So I think that's very much in the mainstream of what reformers in American history have always been fighting for. The, the, the movement against uh, robber baron political corruption and the corruption of the late 19th century, early 20th century was all about the abuse of other people's money. That is, insurance company executives, corporate executives taking other people's money out of corporate treasury and spending on politics. And that's you know, precisely what's, what's at stake here. Uh, another point you made was you said that um, can anyone demonstrate that corporate spending or corporate contributions in the states caused any political corruption? I mean, you know, come, you know, come spend a, a week in any state legislature in the country, and you will find lots of examples of the impact that corporate money's got. But you don't even need to do that. All you have to do is read a Supreme Court decision like uh, Caperton versus Massey. Now, in that case, um, in West Virginia, they had a rule that corporations could spend whatever they wanted, and um, the, uh, the the Massey Corporation spent uh, millions of dollars. Um, to defeat a state Supreme Court justice who had ruled the wrong way on a case involving lots of money, which it turned out they owed another business. It was one business against another. They got mad at the Supreme Court justice. They poured millions of dollars in the campaign. They were able to defeat that person. The person who they supported, who got in, then ended up ruling on their case. And it was such an egregious case of what takes place all, every day across the country that the Supreme Court said it violates due process for the candidate that was backed by the Massey Corporation to actually get to sit on and hear this very case. So that would be one clean example where no less authority than the United States Supreme Court says that was unjust, unfair, and creates at least the patina, the appearance um, of corruption. Of course, the Massey Corporation is a fascinating example in general because this is you know, another company uh, where you've got the CEO spending both personal money and lots of you know, millions of dollars of personal money, but also money from the corporation to advance the corporate interest and to try to blockade public regulation, leading, of course, in 2010 to the tragic accident that caused the deaths of 29 coal miners uh, uh, in, in West Virginia. And if you can go back and read any of this stuff, it's directly linked to the corporation's refusal to abide by a series of citations that were handed down uh, by mining regulators, um, and instead putting the money into campaigns to try to thwart regulation and to defeat the politicians who they thought were on the wrong side. So, I mean, this is, this is real world stuff that we're talking about, where the corporations are now invited to become political actors rather than to uh, abide by the law to try to thwart and change the political process. Another great example is what BP Oil did. Go back and read the exposés done by the New York Times and the Washington Post about the political activities of BP Oil and the way that they were able to thwart the environmental regulators through um, either campaign spending or direct lobbyist spending or corruption of the regulators involved. So, um, you know, I think that there, there's, uh, there's an infinity of examples that you could point to to see the way in which money corrupts. The point about Citizens United is that it did not vindicate any First Amendment right or free speech right of any human being who didn't already have money to spend money in politics, except for the right of the CEO to take other people's money out of the corporate treasury. The, the CEO could already spend whatever he wanted of his own money, uh, the corporate executives, the members of the board could spend whatever they wanted, the employees could spend whatever they wanted. This is all about taking the money that existed in the corporate treasury for other purposes that was amassed through economic activity and then directing it for political purposes. Isn't that each of the employees can spend their own money? Uh, what if they don't have it? Oh, well, I'm glad you raised that point because what is a union 
a union is a membership organization where union members voluntarily join. Now, Jim talks no, about cases no, where... No, no, Well, right, okay, and in those cases, your team has gotten rulings from the Supreme Court saying that anybody can get a rebate for money uh, spent by the union that the union member dissents from. And I wonder, do you agree with that as to shareholders too? Should we have legislation or a Supreme Court ruling that any corporate shareholder who disagrees with the CEO's decision to spend money in politics should get a prorated rebate from the corporation? And if not, why not? No, no. I agree, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, it's no, called the Beck rights, by the way. Yeah. No, because a shareholder is not required to invest in a given company. It's the, you have no First Amendment right against a company. Uh, you only have a First Amendment right, or a union. You only have a First Amendment right if there's government laws that compel you to do things. And that doesn't exist with shareholders, but it does exist with uh, many uh, members of unions. So you don't support you don't... the law uh, to to uh, give money in agency shops, for instance, give money, and then uh, they have a First Amendment right to prevent it from being used in, in politics. So uh, now, uh, corporate governance, you know, I, I do think really that issue about um, spending somebody else's money, spending somebody else's money, is a corporate governance uh, rule or, or issue that really doesn't have anything to do with whether or not it's political spending. Uh, uh, you know, the, the reformers have, have never complained about all the money that, that major corporations are giving to them. I mean, go to the Brennan Center website and you'll see a whole laundry list of five, Fortune 500 companies that are given to the Brennan Center for them to advance their political agenda, which is campaign finance uh, reform. Uh, it, it, you know, uh, so they don't object to other people's money being used to advance some liberal agenda item uh, by giving money to uh, uh, the Brennan Center. Uh, well, I just think it's a governance issue. There, there are a whole set of rules about when it is appropriate for the agents of a corporation to engage in various activities on behalf of the corporation. And, uh, uh, you know, they can be held to account for those. And, and all of their spending, whether it's given to the Brennan Center, uh, or given to a candidate, or given to a super PAC, uh, is governed by those rules. And it, you really cannot, under the First Amendment, pick out political speech and have a different rule. You know, more restrictive but rule. But see, here, I mean, what I find amusing about by this the is that the, the Citizens United holding is defended because it apparently vindicates the expressive rights of the members of the corporation, although that is not really a concept that applies to for-profit corporations, but somehow we're vindicating the rights of the shareholders to express themselves or the employees or so on, except when there's legislation to say, okay, make certain that before any money is spent that the shareholders get a say in it, you say, well, no, we don't really need that. that could, that's bothersome. That could slow it down. But so all we've really done is give the CEO the right to spend in the name of other people without any requirement that those people be involved in it. Name me one political organization that has a vote among the members on how they're going to spend their money. The, the unions Why? all operate like that. No, they don't. Yeah, yeah of course they, they do. They don't sit down in a meeting and say, well, first we're going to give $500 to Joe Blow. Then we're going to give ah, $500. Okay, but, but so now this right. is an important point. No, you know, you're, you're not correct about that. I'll tell you why. Because oh, up well, until Citizens well. United, they couldn't take money out of the union treasuries. They had to set up particular political action they committees. Vote there. Wait, the Coke in the they yes, vote. Well, yeah, of course. They, they had, they, what, as I understand it, what the union members did is elect people to a committee, oh, and those people would decide to do exactly. it. Exactly. Well, is that what you support for and, corporations and, and shareholders? Corporation, okay, well, then, then I would support that. that. Corporations, the shareholders vote for the board of directors who elect a CEO who is delegated to make the decision. No. Same procedure. Okay, no, but here's the whole thing. What, we, what we've done is we've circumvented that political process, and now we're saying we're just folding it into general corporate procedure. Not so, special, though. Well, but there is something special about it, which is that's not what the money of the corporation is for. And so I guess, you know, I, I come back to the heart of my argument, which is the Supreme Court, at, at your eloquent urging, did a complete U-turn in terms of the definition of what a corporation is. Every corporation is now, for-profit corporation is now both an economic and a political entity. So you don't think it's in, the in, in a corporation's interest when, for instance, they're going belly up and they want to get a bailout from the federal government to use that money, to use their corporate money to try to get the bailout money. Or let's say 
uh, I would be very troubled that if they if they went and spent money or gave they money to that. if they went and gave money directly to a candidate or to a politician who was deciding about that. Why? If, 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 they, if they don't like Chevron, for instance. If they gave if they gave less than what will corrupt them because it's all subject to tax and the, like the, the it's group. all cut subject to corporate uh, to contribution limits. And your justification for contribution limits is that it prevents giving large contributions that will corrupt a candidate. So we're giving non-corrupted, corruptive uh, contributions to a candidate. So uh, will that corrupt a candidate? No, it's subject to contribution limits. Unlimited contributions to super PACs that are directly tied to candidates, including from Chevron, that I suspect is making sure it can continue buying government contracts. And, and there, there, there you, again, mush issues together. Now, the justification for, and let's all separate because we're all lawyers here, or in potential one, uh, th there are two concepts here. Uh, one is the distinction between a coordinated expenditure, and that is where you do sit down and, and work out with the candidate what the group is going to do, and an independent expenditure where that doesn't happen. In the coordinated expenditure, that's when it is considered a contribution, and there is the potential or quid pro quo in that discussion. Now, the, the, the justification for no contributions for independent spending is on the assumption that it's not coordinated. Now, his complaint sometimes is that, well, they're really, they really are coordinated. They're really not independent. That's a whole other area of the law. There's a whole big federal FEC regulation on that that involves the elements of the advertising that is subject to the coordination rule, which is called the content standard, and the elements for conduct which would coordinate that activity. So analytically, you got to start with, is it independent? I am talking about when it's independent. If that's your complaint, it has nothing to do with super PACs. It has to do with uh, the coordinated spending regulations that have applied for decades uh, in federal election law. So talk about those. The complaint well, is, the is, what is unique about the Let me finish my point. For what is, it is coordinated and the contribution I, limits, the contributions yes. are unlimited to yeah. super PACs. And so, if it's so unlimited at 5,000, the problem wouldn't be as egregious. As a, analytically, analytically, I am saying that it is independent. And if, if it is independent, and the, the determination of independence has to do with a whole other body of law. If it is independent, though, then you have to come to grips with the fact that you can't have a seat, uh, 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 which I invite you to do, rather than mush them all together, uh, is uh, do, do you have uh, the opportunity for a quid pro quo exchange? Is, uh, and is gratitude, which I agree, uh, people, some people are, you know, that feel gratitude when people do nice things for them. Uh, is that should that be enough? Which you, of course never address because you whenever I add, bring that up, you want to talk about is it coordinated? Well, let's we can we can argue about that, but we can also set it aside because when it is truly independent, then, then can we regulate it based on gratitude? Can, can I just pose a question to you? Same about spot. Okay, but, but no response to the question. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you my shot in one second, but I, I want to. But here's what I want to ask. Let's just about. mush it together and forget about. I, I want to disentangle it. I don't want to mush it together. I want to disentangle it. Um, do you think that the law against coordination is constitutional? I would think that, from your perspective, that would be a perfect expression of freedom of association and, and expression. Can you stop but trying to attribute ideas to me? Well, uh, well honest to God, I, I mean, I'm asking. I've that actually point. litigated this issue. I won the case called the Christian Coalition versus Federal Election Commission in 1999 that resulted in these FEC regulations. But so I, 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 I guess I'm asking a different be, question. Though. I'm not. I asking. said that there needed to be. Uh, I recognized and, and agreed and conceded that uh, you, you could do a coordinated expenditure and it should be viewed just like a contribution. In other words, and the bridge to that is obviously a contribution is giving money, but it can also be giving a computer, all right? Well, but it also could be uh, paying a bill of the candidate by putting up advertising, but it also could be uh, you 
know, the candidate says, hey, go put up this uh, billboard for me. And here, here's what I want you to say. And this is where I want you to put it. I mean, all those are the same thing as giving money. So the last one is a coordinated expenditure. What I said in that case is there had to be bright lines. Yeah. I guess, I mean, then without attributing anything to you, I understood you. the deregulation position to be there should be no limits on contributions and there should be no coordination rules. And I see a perfect kind of intellectual honesty to that, which is we're going to totally open the floodgates on all spending. We're not going to have any limits on contributions. We're not going to have any limits on expenditures. And there shouldn't be any distinction in the constitutional treatment of them. And all of them are open. And I understand that. But I just think that that has nothing to do with trying to build a political democracy on a principle of one person, one vote, and real dialogue among citizens. So I, I won't attribute that to you. I understand that's certainly the position of a lot of libertarians out there, that we should basically have no campaign finance law. And I think, you know, it's whatever you want to say about it, it is an intellectually respectable and consistent position to take, but I think it's completely antithetical to the development of what our constitutional ideas are about politics and how we, we want politics to operate on the principle of one person, one vote, and not the highest bidder wins. How, 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 many, how many votes does Exxon have? How many votes does Sheldon Adelson have? The, the answers to those questions, respectively, are zero and one, right? What we're talking about here is not buying votes. Super PACs are not on the corner handing out $20 bills to voters. And we don't simply pile this money up and measure who's got the tallest pile to see who wins these elections, and I would think the last Tuesday's results made that absolutely clear because Republican super PACs had by far the biggest pile and they were remarkably unsuccessful. Again, what, what I think this betrays is a remarkable lack of faith in voters to consider arguments, decide which arguments they want to consider for themselves, and then make up their own minds about who they want to vote for. I think that's the essence of democracy. Are, are there questions or comments from the audience? We really should defer some here. Yeah. Right, David, Professor Siegel will have been first. Okay. Uh, lovely, uh, very interesting uh, talk. Uh, Thank you. 
serious discrimination in our country and internationally is sex discrimination. I once saw a black student who was sitting in the front of the class turn to his friend and say, I thought he was colored. <laughs> so, but again, the way I had to demonstrate even to that class that the right to vote is limited to persons, I said, even in the late 1800s, when the country totally freed blacks from slavery and constitutionally gave them the right to vote, guess which ex-slaves were the only ones who got the right to vote? Male ex-slaves. Because no female in the country at that time had the right to vote. Females didn't get the right to vote until the 1920s. So again, it shows me that the right to vote is structured to how our government is organized. And it gives every single person the same power to determine how the government is going to be structured, particularly in terms of who gets elected. And no person in the country had more power than another person in the country when it comes to voting. Now, the serious question I think that the Citizens United case raises is organizations other than persons to be empowered to overwhelm Citizens United case frees up not only corporations, but unions to put money into elections. But let me give you some small data on why freeing up unions to form elections. Professor, can I just take over and then complete that point? Yeah. Because I want to yeah, make that you basically, before Citizens United, Corporations and unions could both form political action committees and get voluntarily donated contributions from executives, from members, from employees. So people already have the right to put their own money in, which again goes to isolate analytically what's going on here, which is the is a transformation in corporate jurisprudence related to elections, which is the CEO can take money out of the corporate treasury and put it in to politics. Other but again, let me show you. And I think Professor Siegel was dying to get in there. So, small small yeah. contrast between unions and corporations. Unions have lost membership over the last three or four years because of the high level of unemployment. And I, when I retired from the African University of Boston, began to do arbitration. Every arbitrator I have talked to over the last three years say arbitration cases have gone down dramatically. Why? Because unions have very little money to spend for arbitration now. I'm sorry, so we're actually if they don't have money to spend on arbitration, they don't have a lot of money to spend on election. Right, sure. Do you want to ask a question? Thank you. 
which are permitted, but again, they need to be in the corporation's best interest. They are justified under this amorphous that this is good advertising, this is goodwill. And yet we let directors and the CEO make those decisions which have less of a direct economic effect on the corporation. In fact, I, I think it would be a breach of fiduciary duty for the court when corporations don't try to influence legislation. That would be good for their corporation. They have taken other people's money, and they have taken other people's money, the shareholders, with the goal of maximizing their profit. Laws, all these regulations in the state and federal law, obviously have a huge impact on the success of the corporation. And if I, as a shareholder, am unhappy that a corporation has supported a controversial museum exhibit or has contributed to uh, some uh, pack, I can sell my stock. So, I, but I think that to, to characterize it that the CEOs are going and spending other people's money willy-nilly, however they prefer, totally ignores the idea that there is this law of fiduciary duty and the business judgment rule that will protect the decisions only if the directors have fulfilled their fiduciary duty. And so I really think that, that the characterization of what goes on in the corporation is mistaken. Um, and then I have a question. Can I respond to that one? Yes, to, okay. to sort of my yes. question. That's an, an excellent, I mean, it's a fascinating question that I think goes to the heart of the issue. It goes right to the heart of the issue. Um, <clears throat> the first thing to note about it is that the premise of your question, even if you were right, it would require public disclosure of exactly what the corporation is doing so the shareholders would know in the public. Maybe I think. they don't disclose the char their charitable contributions okay. and they don't get a vote by their shareholders on charity. All right, so let's come to that question. <clears throat> Do you think that it would violate the First Amendment for um, corporate law to say you cannot make charitable contributions? I don't think it would. I don't think that a private for-profit corporation has a constitutional right to give charitable contributions. In a lot of countries, they can't. And I think there's a good policy argument for not having them do it. I mean, we use corporate tr charity as a substitute for public investment in a lot of public goods here. And it would force us to say, you know, look, if we want to have the arts, let's invest in the arts rather than giving corporations the right, the tax right off to do it. In any event, I think it's a policy question. I don't think corporations have a first amendment. I mean, are you saying they? they I don't think they have a first. I don't think it's a first amendment issue of giving a charitable contribution. Well, then I agree with you, and I don't think it's a first amendment issue to give a political contribution or expenditure either. But they're I, speaking about the process. Because that's not what a corporation is. Are made that will then regulate them. Ah, okay. So, all right. So, so that, then the point is well. Corporations as economic actors in a market society are affected by public laws and public regulation. And I think they absolutely have a right to, you know, if the FCC is going to adopt a regulation, they have a right to send in, you know, comments about it, to testify about it, to say what their position is. Do they have a constitutional right to get involved in the process of political campaigning, candidacy, and election to public office? I don't think they do, and it's never been seen that way before. You see, and so that's what I'm saying. This is a revolution in our jurisprudence to say that private corporations that are chartered for economic purposes have a First Amendment right to have the political expressive rights of the people. That, so that, that is just what, not so. Whatever their that interest is. not so. Oh, wait, would you deny? I mean, that, where does the, do you think the Tillman Act, which bans corporate contributions, Now we're talking about corporation, uh, contributions. Can we stick to the subject? Well, yeah, the subject is corporations and elections. Don't get annoyed with me. No, I, 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 no, I, I, I okay, well, really look, look at corporate spending. Okay, so look at corporate spending. How long was that banned for? Since the, the, the 1940s, for decades. The court has held that political speech is co the core speech protected by the First Amendment. First for Amendment citizens. is that no. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> for citizens, not for corporations. Even, go back decades. Even when <clears throat> your ideas seem to prevail. All right, so now we're agreeing that. We're agreeing that my idea no. and Justice Marshall's idea and Justice Rehnquist's idea and Justice White's idea did prevail for centuries and decades. We're agreeing with that now. 
even when your ideas seemed to prevail, the court always held that corporate speech was protected, was, was speech protected by the First Amendment. Commercial speech you're talking what? about. No, political speech. But what they said, read Austin for God's sakes. Yeah, but what I they said Austin, Austin is, is that there's a compelling governmental interest that overcame the, the First Amendment right to speak. In other words, the, you know, you've got to make these distinctions, Jamie. The political speech was always, always, no matter who, who was doing it, is protected by the First Amendment. Now, can the government regulate it? Yes, if there is a compelling governmental interest. And in Austin, the court said there was a compelling governmental interest. I was disagreeing with you just jumping over or mushing together those two concepts because then it isolates what the court was actually deciding. So it didn't, it, it's never mattered that who the speaker was. What mattered was, in Austin, was that the corporate form created a compelling interest that justified regulating sp uh, political speech. Okay, well, well whether, I mean, the court is formulated different. Whether you're saying that the corporate form generates this massive money that's accumulated for purposes that have nothing to do with politics and therefore uh, constitutes a compelling interest for preventing the corporation from spending money that way, or you're just saying, well, corporation is not a political entity that doesn't have political the political rights of the people. Either way, that has been the dominant rule in American history for for most of the existence of the republic. And so this is like a radical change in terms of it. Now, I think but Professor Siegel raises the right point, which, which is well, it is. It does make a difference. Okay, which well, it is. Well, you disagree with both of them. I understand. You I didn't agree. say that either. What I was saying, it makes a difference historically how the courts have dealt with this. You claim that they dealt with it by saying that corporations were person with political rights. That's false. I didn't say well, that. They, I, the I said they, no, I said that they, they enjoyed the, the same way. political free expression rights as the people, which is what they did for Fine. Fine. Yeah, say not say that they are a person. Say it another way. That's yeah. fine. What, they, what they've actually done is what I said. That is, they've always acknowledged that, that this is speech protected by the First Amendment. But they found a governmental interest sufficient to overcome that. That is different analytically. And it leads us to a different conclusion. And why does your argument have to be based on a fallacious construction? What happened? I, 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 I must be dim-witted. I don't follow the logic of your argument. I, I just don't. And that. you have a question? <laughs> Actually, my question was, and you jumped to it, which was, I, I didn't hear any of you address that assuming the, with the corporation uh, that the speech is protected, where's the compelling interest against this speech? Now, all I've heard from you was that you fear that money could corrupt that speculative fear, which as I understand it, uh, from the, the um, statistics that uh, Mr. Sherman cited, and from many others, is this unfounded fear that's being ginned up without any well, basis to it. And I mean, even the, the ACLU, which is hardly a conservative organization, came into the Supreme Court in this case and wrote an amicus brief sure. and said that this provision is facially unconstitutional. Sure, sure. And so where is that compelling there, there, there is a long, long case record of unlimited money corrupting. And that's why we came out of the robber baron era with the 1907 Tillman Act to try to address that. 1925 Corrupt Practices Act, 1946 Taft-Hartley Act, 1971 Federal Election Campaign Act, and finally Vigra in 2002. It's because we have had at least a century of experience where when you have unlimited money uh, flowing in directly in support of candidates and office holders of political parties, it is corrupting. Just remember the Robert Barron era. That's, that's where this whole movement to try to uh, put transparency and reasonable lids on the amount of money that goes into politics came from. Well, so I, I, I want to respond directly to that. And I've gone back to this a couple times, and I'm also going to address uh, something that Jamie said the last time I said it, which is, you know, does Virginia look like 
the Robert Barron era? Does Utah look like the Robert Barron era? And what we see when we look across the country is that there's no serious correlation between the type of campaign finance regime you have and the level of political corruption you have. And I want to talk specifically about the Massey case that Professor Raskin raised because it's a really fascinating case because that case didn't involve any prohibition on speech. What it involved was a prohibition on certain types of government action. What had happened was that uh, uh, Don Blankenship, and I think also Massey, I think they both put in money, spent a lot of money to try and elect someone to the West Virginia Supreme Court. Now I'll say right off the bat, I think judicial elections are a bad idea. They raise serious due process concerns. But no one said that Don Blankenship shouldn't be allowed to do that, or that the Massey Corporation shouldn't be allowed to do that. What they said is that you have a due process right to a neutral magistrate when you go before the court. And if it can reasonably be questioned that you have a, don't have a, a neutral magistrate, well, then your due process rights have been violated. That judge should have recused. Why wouldn't the magistrate be neutral? What's that? Why, why would the magistrate be neutral just because there was millions of dollars spent to get him elected? That's right. Well, why, why would that compromise his neutrality? Well, f f first of all, I don't think that money spent on elections doesn't influence politicians and the positions that they might take. But politicians, elected candidates to legislatures, are not required to be unbiased. They are not required to be neutral. In fact, we expect them to be partisan. That's why we elect people who ascribe to a certain set of political beliefs. But judges are required to be neutral, and that's a significant distinction. Now, another thing that Professor Raskin didn't mention is that after the US Supreme Court held that uh, Justice Brett Benjamin should have recused, he did cast the deciding vote, the case was remanded to the West Virginia Supreme Court, where the exact same result was reached, this time not by a 3-2 to two vote, but by a 4-1 to one vote. So the idea that the situation in the Massey case genuinely represents a serious incidence of political corruption of the type that was at issue in Citizens United, I think, just does not wash. Wait, so in other words, you disagree with the result in the case? In other words, you think it's okay for someone to get elected with millions of dollars and then uh, of someone else spending on their behalf and then rule on a case involving them? You think that's okay? No, I didn't express, what I'm saying is that, that Massey doesn't have anything to say about the results of Citizens United because judges are different than legislators. Yeah, well, look, then you went on to say it's not that big a deal. Well, in any event, okay, so you want to focus on the difference between judges and legislators. I think the vast majority of American people would be shocked at the idea that millions of dollars of money can be spent to elect either a judge who hears a case or a state senator or a mayor who's going to rule on government contracts related to a particular corporation, and that that's perfectly okay. That's how we should do business in the United States of America. Well, exactly. And, 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 and there are almost no, you know, there's very few laws uh, uh, against any of that, yeah, any of those great horribles. By the way, Craig did not answer your question, so let me try to answer your question. He, he answered the question by mushing things together again. He, he, he talked about tell an act well, which prohibits. It, it's a good one. <laughs> Bunching things together. I like that. It's a Hoosierism. Uh, he talked about the Tillman Act, which prohibited corporate contribution. Then you talked about Taft Hartley, which prohibited corporate expenditures. And, then you, and you said that you, know, you mushed them together. Now, I would agree that they are, uh, when, when we're involved in contribution, the issue is, are you giving so? And I answer your your your, your chart. Uh, are you giving so much money to a person that you can reasonably expect to influence, corruptly influence their decision making? And you know, I go back and forth on that in my own mind. Okay, uh, because but what I do know is uh, our contribution limits are way too low. You cannot even buy a Democrat congressman for twenty five hundred dollars. The anecdotal evidence is it takes 99000 in cold, hard cash to buy a Democrat congressman. That was Jefferson, New Orleans. Uh, it takes, a, the anecdotal evidence is $140 million minimum to buy a Republican, and that is Duke Cunningham. Remember, he had a schedule in his drawer for your earmarks, and how much your earmark was for, he then decided to determine how much you're going to give them. Jack, so, Ab Jack Abramoff has said he could buy a lawmaker for dinner. And that, and well, then, then we have a problem that camping finance laws won't, won't influence, won't affect. But, 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 they, but the point is, is that he, he, he wanted to answer your question about independent spending. 
by saying, well, we've got evidence of contributions corrupting. Uh, there is some evidence of that at, at a high level, but not uh, independent spending. That's well, that's the West Virginia case. That was the one I wanted. That, that was not a that was spending spending. case. Well, it was not a corruption case. No. It was a gratitude case. And when you had... Well, that's because you the Supreme Court has found that gratitude is a compelling interest for regulating people. No, that it's not. But, but not for campaign finance where you have the First Amendment. That is, in uh, Massey was a due process case, not a campaign yeah, finance. Yeah, but it was about, it was about campaign spending. Well, so what? But the, the right, charge, the, the claim was a due process claim. Of course. Of a, of a, yeah. Well, you've got to make distinctions. I'm Jamie. making the distinction. You're it's a due process requirement of an impartial decision maker. In campaign finance, there is no such thing. Requirement. There is a due process. You mean in the legislative process is what you mean? Then, because yeah. what we're talking about campaign finance and the judicial process. So what you're saying is, well, I think I think that was the point that you were making before, which is, well, all right, we don't think it's fair if judges are getting elected with millions of dollars being spent on them and then deciding on the cases of the spenders. But we think it's fair if the legislators. I dare. I just think that distinction. I just think that's something that's rejected <laughs> by the vast majority of the American people. Well, I think that the American people don't want. Corporate money yep. spent in that way, whether we're talking about judges or we're talking I'm about... I'm sorry, I'm talking about... Well, I probably could, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of amusing. And, um, also, um, I kind of want to bring up the Massey case, and I think it's important to talk about the health 
pastures, you know, uh, saying that they have clout and, and the whole economic as well as. Um, I'm sorry to get you off. Sorry, 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 but did you have a okay? If you had a question, you could just ask that now, or no, I, if you could move on to the next. It, it was a comment, but I, I'd like to quickly just add a little point on that. Uh, you know, that is, by the way, the point of negative advertising. It is to drive down, uh, to suppress voting turnout. So in 2012, with all this new vast spending that mostly went into ne negative advertising. We have seen a dramatic decrease in total turnout in 2012 compared to 2008. And particularly in some targeted states like Texas and others, the uh, decline in turnout was even greater. That's the point of negative advertising, is to make sure you stay on. Actually, that's not true, Craig. I, I, I actually got the statistics, and, uh, uh, and these are for the uh, the states uh, that were the um, what, we, what we call them? swing states, swing states, okay, uh, and it compared the vote uh, uh, for Romney versus McCain uh, and and uh, Obama's 2008 and 2012 numbers, and of course they did not consider Indiana because Indiana was not a swing state this time, but they considered the uh, one three six nine ones that everyone considered to be swing states. Romney only won one, which was North Carolina. Uh, the, the increase and decrease in votes in those states was there was an additional vote of 549,000 for Romney versus McCain. There was a decrease of Obama of 454, or actually a net increase of about 100,000 in those nine states. Now, I would agree that negative campaigning can, I don't think it's his purpose, but I think it can be, it can result in somebody not voting for a candidate. But what, what negative advertising is, is when you're pointing out uh, what, some uh, liability, some you know, mistake, some bad vote, whatever, of your opponent. Everybody calls that negative advertising. Well, you know, this is, elections are inherently a comparison. And each of the candidates have done, in people's minds, a good thing and a bad thing. You know, good things and bad things. And, and they, they evaluate that candidate based on that. They evaluate this candidate based on that. And then decide whether to vote for one or the other or none of them. It's perfectly, it would be perfectly understandable that somebody might say, well, each of these candidates have done things that I just, you know, I'm just not at all comfortable with. And I'm not going to endorse either one by voting for them. But that is not a bad thing. I mean, that's an appropriate, rational uh, thing for somebody to do. Not pretend that everybody has only done good things when you compare those. We've got to compare good things and bad things. And, uh, and of course, negative advertising is simply engaging the voters in, uh, in what are the, is the other side of every candidate. But just to get the national figure in, in 2012, 118 million Americans voted in the presidential race. In 2008, 131 million Americans voted in the presidential race. So we saw a dramatic decline in turnout in 2012. Yes, so two, two quick points. Uh, one, on the point of corporations being persons, if they're persons, you would think they have the right to free speech on the First Amendment. So one argument for corporations being persons is to get it out of the 14th Amendment. But the 14th Amendment starts all persons born or naturalized. So they're talking about natural persons, they're not talking about artificial persons. Another source of corporation based persons is the Supreme Court case, the most of you are familiar with, Santa Clara, 1886, where that issue wasn't briefed, it wasn't brought up in oral argument, and it wasn't in the unanimous decision by Justice Harlan. Instead, before oral argument began, Justice Chief Justice Wade said, I don't want to get into the business of corporations being persons that we agree they are. So uh, after this decision came down, the decision didn't say anything about that. The clerk who did the head notes uh, asked Justice, Chief Justice Wade, did I hear you correct, correctly? And should I put it in the head notes? And Wade says, if you heard me correctly, I'll leave it up to you. So the first line in the head notes, and that's not, of course, that's not a decision is that corporation the person of the 14th Amendment. So that's a very fabricated source of this. this is the other yeah, but what does that have to do with citizenship?
United, Citizens United involved a federal law, so you don't take it through the filter of the 14th Amendment. It is directly the application of the First Amendment to the federal law. And the First Amendment does not say persons shall have the right to, or you know, the rights of persons to, uh, you know, shall not be abridged to speak. You know, what, what, what it says is that Congress shall make no law abridging speech. So well, Congress, why does that have to do with, like, Congress says you nothing, know, right? Congress and any state can make laws. But, but, but citizens unite. I'm just trying to make a distinction yeah. here. I understand your point about the 14th Amendment, and that is pertinent to state laws. And, and it's only pertinent because of the framing of the 14th Amendment. It is not pertinent to the application of the First Amendment to federal laws because you don't go through the filter of the 14th Amendment. I think the right. First Amendment... The basis for that was to give free speech to personal, individual persons, not to corporations. Actually, they, re they rejected that in Citizens United. They said, we're not dealing with the 14th Amendment. Uh, we're dealing with the First Amendment to protect speech. It's not given to particular entities like persons. It's given to the, the uh, activity of speaking. So, so they weren't saying corporations are persons. They said that that was completely irrelevant. That's the 14th Amendment. Amendment issue, not a first amendment. Okay, so we differ. I say speech comes from individuals who can speak. Corporations cannot speak. They can't do a lot of things. The other point I wanted to make, uh, which is interesting, and others have suggested that we have two choices. One is to get the court to confess error or to amend the Constitution. I think there's a third remedy that's much more practical. I think if you look at Citizens United, they one assertion after another without any evidence at all. And evidence started to come from Montana. So don't bother with the evidence. So I think Congress has every right to hold hearings, build a record, see what damage is being done to our process, our political process. And members are spending way too much time on raising money when they should be legislating to the other side. So I think Congress has every right to hold hearings, build a record to show that Citizens United is not based on any evidence, and here's evidence, and then you say, well, could Congress pass legislation directly contrary to Citizens United? So yes, they can. And then the court puts us right to that. But don't wait for the court to change its mind, and don't wait for constitutional error. Thank you. I, I, I'd like to speak just very, very briefly to the 14th Amendment point you made, because that is actually a much more radical position than it sounds like, because that would not just deprive corporations of First Amendment rights vis-a-vis -vis the states, but it would also deprive them of Fifth Amendment rights vis-a-vis -vis the states. State governments would actually be allowed to seize corporate property under eminent domain and not pay any just compensation, and that would raise no federal constitutional issue whatsoever. I, don't, I would be surprised if there's anyone in this room who thinks that that is the law. Just an interesting little point, uh, just a historical fact. The clerk who wrote that corporations are people under the 14th Amendment in the Southern Pacific Railroad versus Santa Clara case was a railroad lobbyist. Just want to highlight that. Uh, my observation of the entire session that's gone on there, it seems that we're, there's not a lot of practical discussion of the ramifications of Citizens United. It seems to be a discussion in a vacuum by which some people live in fantasy land and other people argue in that fantasy realm. I mean, if you look at the, we talked about the 2012 election. Of the six instances where challengers have raised incumbents, Two were still been counted, but of the four that we know, the Fed winner, three of those four people won the election. And so we're not really talking about, we're talking about a bunch of people who were incumbents who raised a bunch of money that went on to win elections. We don't talk about the nature of being able to get into the political system and that component of the voice. We also don't talk about the, the nature of, of advertising as it's uh, in reality. I mean, Every year, Coke gets more revenue and gets more money than Pepsi in advertising, though in taste tests, people will see the dispute between the actual differences between the two products. I mean, we're not looking at how advertising is changing the landscape and how the decisions open up Pandora's box of speech, where we're, especially in the realm of the actual conversation that's taking place. We talk about the right to speak and these great conversations that we're having. If we were to intelligently look at the news landscape, we're not actually getting any real discussions. I mean, go look at a 30-second advertisement if you're hearing either a lie or a biased assertion by either one of the parties. So we're completely neglecting the reality of the situation where we're looking at the incumbent advantage by raising money 
by the actual nature of the conversation we're having with regards to speech and by the actual nature of the speech. So I'd like to hear a more practical discussion about what's actually happened since that decision and how it's tangibly changed the, the real world landscape of politics. Well, most of the advertising I see is you're going to get more sex if you buy the candidate or buy the, the product. Not in the Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't have sex. <laughs> one, one of the things that, that you touched, I mean, so you sort of alluded to this idea that, well, you know, people engage in advertising because advertising works. Coca-Cola wouldn't spend a lot of money on advertising if it didn't convince people to buy Coca-Cola. Um, and, and there's this sense, I suppose, that what we're trying to get at with elections uh, is not uh, the result of, we, we don't want the result of advertising. What we want is to uncover the general will. Um, and I think that this just buys into the demonstrably false notion that the general will exists, right? People have won Nobel Prizes by showing that you cannot just take a bunch of people's individual choices and aggregate them into some meta choice that applies to everyone. Elections are just snapshots of public opinion on election day. And the question is, are we willing to ban peaceful political expression to try and affect what that public opinion can, can I just, the, I, unfortunately I've got to go, so let me just take this as a, as a last shot here. I, if you want to go down that road, and the identity of the speaker is irrelevant, and we're going to revolutionize the role, the political role of the corporation in American life, I think that you've got to say then, not-for-profit corporations, universities, churches, state governments, local governments, everybody's got the right to speak. The identity of the speaker is irrelevant. You can take whatever monies and whatever treasury, you can spend it on politics because it's just speech, the identity of the speaker is irrelevant. And I, I just think that that, to my mind, I don't want to go there. I would much rather if the money that comes into politics comes from real live human beings, that we put our money in. There's enough inequality just among natural people that we don't need to add all of the extraordinary inequality by taking money out of corporate treasury wealth and converting it into political slush funds. And, and as a result, only the wealthy can speak. Your, your vision is only wealthy speaking people speaking about politics because as soon as you prohibit groups, you're prohibiting people of average means to pool their resources. Oh, groups of people why put their own money into why do that? Why do you want a system yeah. in which only rich people okay. can speak? Well, let me just, I, I hope you don't think I'm running out on you, but I'm going to run out on you. But i got to say this. If any money that we put in, the four of us at this table could put our money in, that's great. I'm all for it. It's a group. It's got money. It comes from a membership organization. Corporation is not a membership organization. Now, the, the benefit of that position, I'm, I'm sorry to steal the last word from you, is that it, it seems it would cover almost all of the spending by super PACs because most of that money came from wealthy individuals. I'm sorry, not can some we just give Professor Askin a hand? So I, I'm, I'm pleased to hear Professor Raskin endorse the notion that billionaires should be allowed to pool their money in super PACs and try to influence the elections. I agree with him 100%. Okay, so we're going to take one more question, uh, and then we'll hear some closing remarks. Uh, this is for Mr. Sherman. Um, I, you had observed, I think, that uh, you know the, the effect of all this, all this corporate spending in politics isn't actually all that great. If you look at the but you see, you know, especially looking at this last election, it didn't seem to have that big of an effect. Um, and I, I've also seen studies like that in the past, uh, noting those things. But I've always, I've always wondered, it, and I'm wondering if you have an answer for this, why do they keep doing it? Why, why do they keep pouring money into this? It, it, it seems to me like corporations are like the more, most efficient wealth generators in the history of the planet. So it seems like a very odd thing they keep pumping money into something that's such a spectacular failure all the time. And so, well, so, so my first response, if you, to go and it bridges to my, my previous response, is if you look at the people who really seem to have spent their money quite foolishly, it's not corporations. It was individuals. It was Shell Nielsen, who put in $53 million and was just spectacularly unsuccessful. I would also say, I don't think that spending money on elections has no effect. I, I, I think it can have effect, and it's rational for people to do it, particularly when the federal government you know, controls $3.8 trillion of American money. People are going to want to try and influence how that money gets spent, and it can certainly make a difference of the margins. But what I do disagree with is this notion that corporations 
have this unfettered ability to essentially make up voters' minds for them. There's a range of policy positions. Corporations can affect things at the margins. But what corporations or no wealthy group or individual can do is make a totally unpalatable political choice palatable to someone. All right, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. When you walk outside, we actually have a few books of our, of our brief, if you'd like to have a copy. Um, also, this Friday, we'll have a happy hour at Public Tunley from 4 to 8, so you're welcome to join us if you'd like. Uh, if you'd like to participate in the publication at all, come talk to me or Emily. We accept uh, applications in the fall. Uh, but if you have any questions or would like to start anything right now, we'd, we'd be happy to help you with that. And finally, if we could just give another round of applause to our wonderful speakers and the live conversation that we had here. Thank you. Just a final point. Less than one week after the election, the fundraising has already begun. Yeah. Mm -hmm.